you to know that this man has a smile that lights up a television screen from here to Bangor, Maine. The greatest point guard to ever play the game is here. Yeah. Thank you. A legend. A, a super legend. The greatest the, point guard ever to play the game of yes. basketball. And normally when Envy says special guest, it could be anyone, but this time it really is a special yeah, guest. Yeah, that's right. Mr. Magic Johnson. Irvin Magic Johnson is here. What's up? What's up? Man, I got Magic Johnson Woo! in here. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a minute, man. Yeah. Wait a minute. Hold on. Okay, okay. All right. <laughs> Yo, Magic. Come on, man. Come on, man. Let me get this moment in. All right. Go ahead. All right. Uh, Who's the best point guard of the 1980s, Isaiah? Come on, Zeke, say yourself, Zeke. <laughs> say yourself, Zeke. No, honestly, honestly, <laughs> I will have to say Magic Johnson. Number one, Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson, a 6'9 uh, lead guard. Never heard of things like this. Magic is straight down the middle. Still going, still going. Oh! He's the only guy I've ever seen. We'll, we'll look at a guy, time him, measure his speed, measure his distance, look away for about three seconds, look you off, and then hit that guy on the dime without ever looking. Everybody wanted to be mad. Everybody wanted to go out there and throw the fancy passes. Look at that, that three scoring. I don't believe it. He wanted to win so bad, but he always had fun. He was always smiling, he always appealed to the crowd. He always wanted the crowd to be in it because he knew that's what the team fed off of. And he was smart in that aspect. And the crowd is getting nutty. If I could do that, then I'd be on my way. If I could learn how to give an assist and then play to the crowd and get the crowd involved, then I think that's what it's all about. I can remember back in the day when I used to watch this man, I would love to play against him. And he was retired when I got into the NBA. And when he came back, I thought that it was wonderful. It was amazing that I was actually out on the floor at the same time as he was. And he was handling the basketball. I mean, this is like a dream come true. Hey, he hasn't lost a thing. He hasn't lost a thing. Looks good, doesn't he? Yes, he looks very good. I couldn't really talk to him. It was almost like he was talking to me, and I was listening. My eyes were like wide open, and it was like, okay. Yeah, and I, I don't even know if I even heard what he said, but I was just watching his mouth go, and I was like, okay. After he stopped and I went off, I was like, I was just talking to Magic Johnson. Unbelievable. I mean, when you finally see somebody for the first time that you really love, uh, or that's appreciated your entire life, and you meet them for the first time, I mean, it's just like a total shock. But it made me feel great because that was my idol growing up. I mean, he was the guy that I really wanted to be like. He was the guy that just set the tone uh, for guys like myself to come into the game and play point guard being over 6'5". I was just telling him that it was just great to be out on the floor at the same time as him. You could probably already guess that we were going to put Magic at number one since he's the only point guard that showed up on our top 10 greatest players of all time list, and with good reason. Of the 15 point guard related stats and analytics we looked at as mentioned in the outset, Magic is top 20 in 13 of them and top 10 in 8. On top of that, he won 5 championships, is a 3 time MVP and 2 time finals MVP. He's number 5 all time in total assists number one in assists per game for the regular season and the playoffs, number five in assists percentage, number three in offensive rating, number one in offensive rating for the playoffs, and has the fifth most win shares for the playoffs in NBA history. Those achievements are amazing. Playing alongside other Hall of Fame players like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and James Worthy, Magic could have blended into the scenery and let his teammates run the show. Instead, he had the greatness to stand out among those players and established himself as the leader of the team. His size, mobility, and ball handling skills made him one of the most complete players ever. Proof of this is the fact that he's second only to Oscar Robertson in triple doubles. This guy's a freak of nature, man. <laughs> be able to be 6'9 and handle the ball the way he can handle it. Magic Johnson had tremendous basketball intelligence, like a great base runner knowing as he comes around first base why this can be a triple and not a double. He just sees the whole series of possibilities in front of him. I can remember getting hit in the head on purpose and practice just to show me that I can get the ball to you if you want it open up that eye on the side of your head. 
He brought the playground back into basketball, high five and jumping up and down, enjoying everything, wanting to get the people involved in the game. It's just refreshing to have anybody that comes along with that type of enthusiasm, that love for the game. And you, you can't help but get caught up in that. He had to have fun. It's got to be fun to him. It couldn't just all be work and drudgery and being serious. I mean, he was the most serious, fun person I have ever been around in my life. Irvin, being the point guard, knew that he had to conduct that team. When they were down, he had to psych them up. When they were too high, he had to bring them down. He was really a coach on the court. Magic Johnson was different, and it was evident and clear when he had the ball that things were going on that people hadn't seen. He could do anything on a basketball court. He could be a power forward. He could be the world's tallest point guard. He could be the world's shortest seven-foot center. If you go to the worst seat in the arena, there's only a few that reach that high. You know, Magic Johnson reaches all the way to that top row. Um, I believe I was the second best point guard at that era. Mm -hmm. But Magic Johnson was the best point guard, in my opinion, to ever play. Who are guys, just quick, off the top of your head, that you compete against at the point guard that you felt you guys were so great that just didn't get their just due? I would say in, in the 80s, for, for a short period of time, I, oh, thought, cheeks. I thought Mark Price mm -hmm. had a run in this league for about two years or so that was just about as good as anybody. Uh, you d definitely Mo Cheeks, uh, Gus Williams. I have one for Ti you. Tiny Archibald was still, DJ? you know, at his, at Dennis. his, you know, Dennis. Gen Dennis. Yeah, but, Dennis. Yeah. but, but saying all that, saying there, all that, there, there was two. It, it, none of them were like Magic. Right. Not, none of us. Or you. None of us were like Magic. During his 13-year NBA career, Magic accumulated three MVP awards, three Finals MVP awards, 10 All-NBA First Team selections, five championships, and 12 All-Star appearances. Magic Johnson is fifth all-time in total assists, not bad for what most would define as a short career, 18th all-time in steals, and first all-time in assists per game. Magic Johnson had an amazing career and is perhaps the greatest point guard of all time, depending on who you ask. He was born in Lansing, Michigan, to Christine and Irvin Johnson in 1959, one of 10 children. His legend grew from playing on the playgrounds because everybody would see this kid and come out, man, he can play. And then they tell somebody else and then it just got all over town and they start looking for him and asking for him, let's play, let's play. In 1974, Irvin took his playground game to Everett High School. I could see the greatness of Irvin Johnson when he was about 14 years old coming into high school. Once we got in a game, he would always include everybody. He wanted to win. That meant if he had to score 50, he would. But if he had to score 20 and get everybody else involved, that's the greatness I, that I appreciated about Irvin. I just love uh, playing and getting out there and, uh, you know, Hope my team win, if I'm playing pick up ball, whenever, I just want to win. In his first season, Johnson pulled the Everett Vikings out of the doldrums of losing basketball as they became state championship contenders for the first time. In the process, he became the darling of the press. The guy came in and said, uh, I got to give you a nickname, I've never seen anything like this. And I said, uh, I'm 15. Now I start giggling. All my boys, they giggling too. Like, yeah, okay, yeah. You gonna get my nickname. <laughs> so he says, somebody's called Dr. J. Somebody has the name Big E. He said, can I call you Magic? I like, yeah, right. So the next day in the paper back home, Irvin Magic Johnson. In his senior year, Magic averaged 29 points and led Everett to where it had never gone. For this team, Everett High School, who really didn't have a history of basketball, to win the state title, you know, it was just like, who's Everett? And all of a sudden, here they are, and they couldn't be stopped. I thought he was very good. There's no question about it. I, actually, I thought he was probably the best guard on the team. Irvin Johnson, look at that. Oh, what a play. We didn't get to play a lot, but you could tell. I think our first game was in Kentucky. We got about a 10, 12-point lead. And they put us in went to 25, 30, just that fast. Fast break again, three on two, Griffin. Wow! Look at that steal by Larry Bird. Take us out, 
the league go back down, put us back in. That's third, and Johnson. The show started again. As a youngster, Irvin displayed his own strong work ethic on the blacktop. I was out there all day long. Before we went to school, the bus leave at 7, 7.30. I was out there at 6, 6.30, working on my game. My mother sometimes had to bring me food or she would have one of my brothers and sisters go get that boy so he could eat something. From a very young age, Irvin knew what he wanted to do. He had it all planned out. My dreams were to play in the NBA and become a businessman. The first neighborhood basketball powerhouse, Sexton High. I knew the players, I knew the tradition. I wanted to be a part of that. And it was on the west side of town, which was at that time, predominantly black. But when Lansing, like many cities in the mid-70s, began busing to desegregated school system, Irvin's journey took an unexpected detour to a predominantly white school across town. My first day at Everett High School was my first time I really had to understand there was a, a race problem. Nobody white would speak to anybody black, and nobody black would speak to anybody white. A lot of racial tension, a lot of fights, rioting. They didn't want minorities there. He kind of shrugged it off, and basically his attitude was, OK, well, I'll, I'll overcome this. Whenever there was any racial problems, the principal would get Irvin and go talk to these kids. I can just see him with his big hands, calm down, just calm down. He'd break up fights. He talked with his friends, telling him, you know, let it go. You know, we can't fight about everything. Let's just chill. Let's play basketball. And there was no dispute over Irvin Johnson's ability to play ball. His talent was so great that soon after his varsity debut, a local reporter, dazzled by his exploits, gave the budding star a nickname. In the beginning, I thought it was foolish and dumb. You know, I didn't know nothing about a nickname. Then what happened was, you start saying, wait a minute, it fits my game. Hanging out with my boys on the street corners, we used to sing Temptation songs. They start saying, hey man, Magic, that's cool. And then people on the street start saying, hey Magic. And I said, hmm. <laughs> he bought into it, and um, I think he felt he had to kind of live up to that name. And I must say that he did. His senior year, Johnson did at Everett what he had planned to do at Sexton, win the state championship. Recruited by over 100 schools nationwide, the hometown hero stayed put and attended Michigan State. He wanted to be a guard from day one, even though he was 6'8". His first game, he scored seven points and had seven turnovers, and there were people that said, well, Judd is ruining Magic Johnson, playing him out of position. But Magic quickly adjusted to his new position, and by mid-season, the Spartans stood in the glare of the national spotlight. That's what I remember about Michigan State, the fact that we got a chance to change college basketball in a sense, and we did it with style and play. He had an unbelievable basketball IQ. He was the, the leader. He was a take-charge guy from the day he walked on the court. And if somebody else came in, it could really make a mess of it. This is for the whole west side, y'all yeah, throw it up. This is for the whole east side, y'all yeah, throw it up. For my 30s in the Midwest, y'all yeah, know it up. For the filthy riding south, y'all yeah, know what's up. Get your dollar signs up, stop playing games. Get your motherfucking paper. By any means, man, get your hustle on, gangster. Whatever it takes, get your scramble on, baby, bro. Seconds turn to days, then it is. Then the next thing you know, you got gray hairs. In the game, done change the bread, got stared. Got stared. Fuck all that. Hey, yo, twin, man, spit that shit. Let these niggas know what time it is. Yo, 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 I know you're loving my style. Don't smile up in my face. My voice is like basketball, the way I shake and bake. As Michigan State's resident basketball genius, Magic had clearly found a new home. He also found Cookie, his future wife. We totally fell in love at first sight. I had a boyfriend at the time, and when I decided to go to Michigan State, he's, no, you can't go to Michigan State. I'm like, why can't I go to Michigan State? You know, he's like, you're going to meet Magic. You're going to meet Magic and Mary. And I, that, I'm, that's the truth. That's, that's a true story. And I, at the time, I, I had no clue who he was. He had the whole world at his feet at 18. He became two different people. When he was with me, 
He was Irvin. But the minute we stepped outside that door, he became Magic. I mean, Magic was his stage name. Even he would laugh about it. Well, he always says, there's two people. There's Irvin Johnson from East Lansing, and there's Magic Johnson from Hollywood. Irvin Johnson is another guy, you know. Here's Magic over here, and here's Irvin over here. Irvin is this fun-loving guy. Geronimo! Double dribble. Never thought. Aren't you going to get the stretching? I don't stretch. Stretching's for show-offs. My ball plan does the talking for me, so. <laughs> you know, when I was in college one time, I was watching a game on TV. They had this home box office thing. And I turned on the, this game they were playing against Russia. And I was watching Magic play, and I go, oh, my God, that's the best player I've ever seen play because I didn't follow basketball. And he was a sophomore at the time. <laughs> I remember telling a friend of mine, I said, they're going to win the NCAA championship this year. Well, we go all the way through undefeated, and there's magic standing there. It's just like it was made to happen. On the night of March 26, 1979, it was the NCAA championship, Indiana State versus Michigan State, a game that still ranks as the highest-rated college final ever on television, a game that's now remembered as a prologue to a rivalry that transformed a sport and intertwine two legacies. But on that night, March 26, 1979, the first time Magic Johnson and Larry Bird ever went head to head on a basketball court, they were simply two young men trying to win a very big ball game. Well, this is probably the biggest game I'll ever play in my life, and I just feel like, you know, I'm representing not only myself, my team, but we're representing our school and our, and our town of Terre Haute. Was, uh, a dream come true, really, for me. Uh, I won the state title back in my home state, and then my next accomplishment was going to the NCAA and playing in uh, a game like tonight in the finals. They were two stars thrown together by the cosmos to compete. Yeah, everything was written with uh, Bird versus Magic, Magic versus Bird, that whole thing. And, 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 and it wasn't Indiana State versus Michigan State anymore. It was, it was Larry Bird versus Magic Johnson. Larry Bird had become, alongside Magic Johnson, the talk of college basketball. I think Magic wanted to be friends with Larry Bird. He wanted to be friends with him on the World Invitational Tournament, and Larry just wasn't very receptive. I think he wanted to be friends with him during the Final Four. Larry wouldn't even go over and shake his hand. So now Magic's saying, well, what's with this guy? Everybody loves me. How come you don't love me? Just a year after sharing the court on Team USA, they were back together. And the day before the big game, Magic couldn't wait to greet his old playmate. And then State was on practicing, and we were waiting in the tunnel. We got there early. I wanted to definitely say hello to Larry, you know. When they came through, it was like nobody was saying nothing. I wanted to go toward him, like his guys, like, made sure that he didn't say nothing. And then they kind of started snickering, like, Michigan State, you in trouble. We're going to kill you guys tomorrow. That just said it's on now. It is Indiana State against Michigan State. I'm Bryant Gumbel, and the fans here are going bananas. I mean, let's face it, if, if Larry Bird were black and, and came from Chicago, it wouldn't have been as big a deal. They, they, were, they were polar opposites. One black, one white, one outgoing, one shy. That was the charm of the attraction. The Bird against Magic. All of the superlatives have been used, and believe me, all of them have been warranted. Heading into the tournament, Magic was the bigger star. But by tip-off, it was Bird, having hardly missed a shot in the semifinal, who had become the focus of fans, and more importantly, of Michigan State. We actually had two men on Larry everywhere he went. There he is, Dick. Look at they have him sandwiched in completely. I'm surprised they didn't play a box on one. You know, four guys on Larry and one on the other four, um, because that's they didn't have a lot of talent. You know, if you stop Larry, you pretty much stop them. Look at the pressure around him. Two, three men, and he's short. I didn't play well at all. Biggest game of my life, I didn't play well. I think our, our length and our size, our jumping ability was able to bother him. Bird hanging, can't score. 
I didn't shoot well. Missed, uh, I think, three free throws. Larry Bird has had a cold shooting night. I battled him, but I didn't have it. I thought you did a great job on Larry Bird in the zone denying him the ball. Yes, uh, Coach uh, gave us a good game plan to go against Larry Bird, and all we had to do was go out and do it. That's what we've done. And congratulations, and Super Bowl game. It was over, you know. That was my four years. I was done. No, it still hurts. When you win 33 in a row and you walk into a game, you know, you never know what to expect, but I expect to win. We didn't win. Toughest loss I ever took. I, I knew it was going to haunt him forever because we were going to see each other a lot. Uh, in college, when we met for the uh, 1979 NCAA championship, you know, I had a real dislike for Larry. You know, he's a, a very uh, competitive player, and I'm a very competitive player, and uh, we go head to head, and uh, we go for blood almost. The vibe was, it was nasty, it was ugly, it was, uh, we didn't like each other. Magic, were you inclined early on to b become friends with this guy because you, you were drawn to him because of his uh, basketball abilities? Was, was we, Did you want to be friends with him from the beginning? From the beginning, I wanted to be friends, but Larry didn't want n none of that. <laughs> you know, and so... <clears throat> you know. They had some wonderful moments on the court, but they probably spoke to each other four, maybe five times during that entire time period. And, and it was more like, hello, how are you this morning, Larry? I'm good, Magic. What'd you have for breakfast? Don't remember. Have a nice day. But such curtness was hardly strange coming from Larry Bird. I'm the one that did all that, to tell you the truth. It was, I just don't want to be hanging around him. I mean, that was my main competition. I think he was a mystery to the extent that, that, that he wanted to be a mystery. He didn't enjoy doing interviews. He didn't go out of his way to do them. He wasn't particularly good at them. He was kind of like, hey, this is who I am. You want to know who I am? Watch the game. And so I, I said, OK, if that's how it's going to be, then we have to be like that. <laughs> that's right. You don't like me? Fine. All right, good. I don't like you either. I started disliking him, too. Then, you know, so, uh, but you know, he told me that you know, I smiled all the time, and he knew that uh, I, I will smile at you, but I want to cut your heart out at the uh -huh. same yeah. time. So yeah. he knew that that was part of my strategy right. to get him, lure him in as so, my friend. So he, he didn't want to show, demonstrate any weakness by being, becoming your friend. Now, did you feel what his advances to being a friend and you just rejected them? You were not interested? You didn't like him? I mean, what was, what was your it's side not, of that? It's not like one more girlfriends, you know what I mean? <laughs> uh, when you say advances, I get a little scared. But, uh, <laughs> But, um, I probably did snub him. I don't remember it, but I'm, I'm sure I did. I didn't want any, you know, like I call it love fest, hugging and, and, and slapping high fives with opponent. You're there for a reason. You're there to win a game. <laughs> you know, my, my thing was when you compete, you're really not friends. You, you want to keep an edge. He wanted to be the Wizard of Oz. He wanted to intimidate people and keep them at bay. The further we are away from each other, the more I like it. I was like that through high school and through college, but Irving is an outgoing guy. He loves everybody. He wants to high five and, you know, he got that big, <laughs> big smile. My goal was to try to take three of them teeth home with me. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's two different perspectives. <laughs> that's interesting because, uh, I Indiana, uh, uh, Michigan. Uh, Aided by forward Greg Kelser, Magic led the Spartans into the Final Four. At the beginning of the game, did you meet uh, Irvin uh, there? Why? <laughs> <laughs> do you do you remember trying to talk to uh, Larry before the game? Nope. Yeah. I, I, you had I, learned your lesson. I learned my lesson, 
And uh, at that time, he was going after something I wanted bad, and I was going after something he wanted bad. So we didn't want to talk. We wanted to get it on. Meanwhile, across the southern state line, Larry Bird's Sycamores of Indiana State savored their unbeaten season. We were totally shocked. I mean, we'd watched them all year long coming along, and we kind of thought, you know, well, as soon as they get to the tournament, then we'll find out the real thing. And then somehow they just kept winning. Michigan State wasn't a drop kick then either. I mean, back then it was believed that Magic was great, but oh, he couldn't shoot. And so it, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that we'd see Magic and, and Larry in the final. And then the unlikely occurred. Magic and Bird would meet for the national title. Their differences were striking. When Larry Bird played against Magic Johnson uh, in the 1979 NCAA Finals, you would have thought that there couldn't be two people less alike in the world. I did not like Larry Bird. He didn't like me because we were both going after the same thing. I wanted to be the best, and he wanted to be the best. So it's like two old gunslingers saying, meet me out front. And, you know, only one could survive. All of a sudden, you had a, a college basketball game that felt like a heavyweight championship fight. This thing picked up momentum, it picked up momentum, and, and here you had this jazzy kid from East Lansing and, and, and the hick from French Lake, and, and one kid with a team of four players that you knew wouldn't be able to get a pickup game as soon as the tournament was over. And then this, this team that, that had to be flashy because they had to keep up with Magic. It was Ali Frazier. It's, it's, it's all it was. As it turned out, they, they were Ebony and Ivory twins. They were, they were the same guy. They were small town guys who grew up on the, their local hard courts where they could spend five hours, seven hours a day just playing basketball. And the only thing they cared about was winning the game. We're mirrors of each other. Uh, I may smile a little bit more, but <laughs> the way we played the game of basketball was exactly the same because we would do anything to win. We didn't care about scoring points. We cared about winning the game and making our teammates better. Magic flew over the Sycamore, scoring 24 points while a beleaguered bird remained on the ground. Magic had a tremendous advantage of guards of that era and even guards of today is that he could see the whole court. He could see over people because of his height and then his great ability to handle the ball and pass. Uh, he could just do more things because he was a 6'8 point guard. Magic was just mind-boggling to me, the way he'd get the ball off the board and dribble it up and make the play. And it seemed like he had his hand in everything. That was a seminal game. It brought a lot of non-college fans to the game who then became college basketball fans. I got a chance to turn Michigan State around and make them a basketball power. We ended up winning the national championship. We got beat because they were the best team. They were the best team in college basketball at that time. I, we knew we was going to play against a great team, Michigan State. As, as, by watching them on film, I knew it was going to be the best team we played against all year. But. Uh, winning 33 games in a row, you know, you sort of take teams light. And, and the NCAA championship, is that right? What, what, what did that, uh, and it was like a 10-point loss, am I right, Larry? Well, it, it was 10 point. <laughs> thank you, Dave. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it felt more, more like a 20-point loss, but, you know, when you're out there playing and you get started in these games, sometimes you go, uh-oh, these guys are pretty good. Right. And I had that feeling at halftime that yeah. these guys were too much for us. I don't know mentally if I was prepared as I should have been for that game because I, um, you know, I didn't have a good game. I shot like seven for 20 from the field and, uh, you know, and our team relied on me to score. So if I had a week to go back on, I'd probably be that week to prepare and, and get ready for that game. What did losing that championship mean to you and how did it affect yeah, that's, you? Yeah, that's the toughest one I've ever taken uh, because, you know, you had all your friends, um, you're at a college. It's really when you step away from home, I, I felt um, in uh, Indiana State, they, they accepted me, brought me in. Um, it was tough, and still tough, yeah. but... Um, still still okay. tough today. Yes. Yeah. And he couldn't escape the memory of losing to him in 1979. Oh, it ate at him bad that he didn't win that national title against Magic. That was something, it just burned him. 
It was one thing for them to be in the 79 championship. Magic had the better team. Everybody agreed with that. How, how about you, Magic? What did winning that title mean for you? <laughs> well, you know, you just heard him. It's still tough for him. <laughs> After the NCAA, somebody else would have just been happy with winning that and just gloated on that. And it only took him that long to say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm moving on to the next step and I'm going to take this other place to the next level. With a stage set for a new era, two players would dominate national attention for the next decade. The Magic Bird College game changed the NBA and colleges. It made the Final Four so popular, and then it totally turned around the NBA because that's where the show was going next, and it was Magic leading the way. It was big then because it was the highest rated college basketball game of all time. If you wrote this, scripted it and tried to make it a movie people would say hey, it's too cliche but in real life we really embraced it and loved it the league needed that the nba at the time struggling doesn't begin to describe where the nba was we hoped the glow that attached to their uh, season would attach to us the rumors say that you played your last college game and that you're heading away from michigan state the rumors were fast. The Los Angeles Lakers select Urban Magic Johnson, Michigan State, 6'8", 200 pounds. He was the number one pick of the L.A. Lakers. They drafted Magic Johnson and they flew him out to Los Angeles, so it was going to be the first time that my dad ever met him. He uh, came to our house, he rang the doorbell, I had the honor of opening the door, and here was this kid with this smile that just blew you away. So I uh, escorted him and Bill Sharman into the house and asked them if they'd like something to drink, made some small talk, and Magic said, you know, I'm really happy that I was drafted by the Lakers, and I'm going to play here for three years, and then I'm going to go play for the Detroit Pistons, because that's where I'm from. Like, my like eyeballs blew out of my head. I couldn't believe what he said. And, um, you know, and you, you got to imagine, I was 17 and Magic's 19. I mean, we're very close in age. He's just another teenager to me. And, um, but he had this command and this vision of exactly who he was and what he, you know, what he loved doing. And I, <laughs> wait, no, wait, this isn't the plan. So I ran upstairs to talk to my dad and say, you know, he just told me that He's going to play for three years and then he's going to leave. And my dad didn't miss a beat, didn't even stop what he was doing. He said, you know, as soon as he puts on a Laker uniform and walks out on that floor, he's never going to leave. What tripped me out was I'm riding, right? I'm riding in the limo and I'm seeing orange trees and lemon trees in people's front yards. I said, stop, I gotta go pick an orange. Said, Are you crazy? I said, no, I gotta do this. And so I ran up like a, like a scared little kid, grabbed the orange and ran back to the limo. I'd never seen an orange tree. I'd never seen a lemon tree. I was fascinated. When 20-year-old Irvin Johnson arrived in Los Angeles in the fall of 1979, he was a world away from Lansing, the only home he'd ever known. <laughs> The Lakers needed a player that was a leader. They needed a rebounder. And they got him one player. He was a breath of fresh air. And I think when he saw this kid out there, he was a kid, uh, with this enormous amount of energy, I think it rejuvenated his interest in the game. It was a wonderful combination because Abdul Jabbar probably needed the burden relieved from him out there every night having to do it by himself. He came at the perfect time for my career because I'd lost a lot of enthusiasm. His skill and expertise is what the team was lacking. We improved uh, so much and made it easy for me to smile. There was something magnetic about this guy. Not only his play, but that smile and personality. He did everything right. You had to follow him. Magic took the once dispirited Lakers into the 1980 Finals versus the 76ers. But when an injury knocked Kareem Abdul-Jabbar out of Game 5, it appeared the Lakers' 3-2 advantage was over. That it, what it is. As far as I was concerned, the it was not his ability or his size. The it was his attitude, was his leadership, was his mind. I mean, I don't have to talk 
about game six at Philadelphia. Magic Johnson will jump. In his rookie season, Magic had helped lead the Lakers to the NBA Finals against the Philadelphia 76ers. I think the Sixers felt the game was like practice. Obviously, they were going to win. You can't come to Philadelphia and win without Kareem. So you could play Magic at center. You can, you can do anything you want. We just wanted to go out and compete. Winning was the last thing on our mind. So when we come out to the center court, Magic steps into the center, and I think it shocked Philadelphia. In game six, with an injured Abdul-Jabbar back home in L.A., Magic played all five positions, scored 42 points, grabbed 15 rebounds, and dished out seven assists. Magic played brilliantly, dealing seven assists, grabbing 15 rebounds, and scoring a season-high 42 points. The Lakers won their first NBA title in eight years. And the most valuable player is Magic Johnson. He starts at center, plays forward and guard, and leads the Los Angeles Lakers to a world championship, 123-107. His performance that game might have been one of the greatest of all time. 42 points. He shot the hook shot, the jump shot. He drove to the basket. He blocked a couple shots. I mean, he did it all. I've never liked Magic Johnson at all, by the way. <laughs> He's a guy that should have stayed in college and got in his college degree. At least stay for one more year till his junior year. We would have gotten another one. I love to win, and uh, I guess that's the thing. I go in thinking we can win any game that I play. Uh, Despite, you know, Kareem went in and we want to say, hey, we did it for you, big fella, because you got us here, and uh, don't, we don't, we don't want to take nothing away from him. A lot of people didn't, really weren't sure whether or not you were going to be making him this league and making it big. And you certainly made a believer out of me, because yeah. I haven't seen you play that much. You were absolutely fantastic. I believe Kareem not playing was the worst thing that could have happened to the 76ers in that series. In just four years, he had won titles in high school, college, and the pros. You know, I, I just did what I did, mm -hmm. and I did it to win. I, I'm so happy that every stage of my career, I won championships, high school, college, NBA. And then the main thing is making my teammates better, mm -hmm. you know, coming down, man. Wasn't nothing like coming down on that fast break, looking left, throwing right, you know, and mm -hmm. hearing the crowd scream. Across the masthead of the Los Angeles Times, the next day it said, it's magic. He starts at center, plays forward and guard, and leads the Los Angeles Lakers to a world championship. He would do whatever it took for the team to win. If it meant getting rebounds, scoring points, getting assists, he would do it. Now you get to the pros. Larry has this incredible year. Bird, a runner. It's good! But there he is, watching in a club, while Magic Johnson wins a championship, and he's thinking, ah, all right, I'm behind two to nothing now. <laughs> I watched that game, and I couldn't believe it. I always wanted to play at that level. But what Bird couldn't possibly have known was that he had inspired Magic's performance when he was named Rookie of the Year earlier that same day. The PR person from the Lakers says, hey, Irvin, the Rookie of the Year voting has come out. And Magic says, okay, well, who won? He said, well, Larry Bird won. And Magic says, well, was it close? And he said, oh, no. He went out that day, yes, to try to win the NBA championship, but also to prove it to one Larry Bird, you know what? I should have been Rookie of the Year. Even though I won the championship, I still wanted to win Rookie of the Year, too. He won that championship. I was pissed. I won him one. But even after he had won one the next year, his obsession only grew deeper. I'd get up in the mornings and see what he did, because their games came on late. Then you look at the box score. I had to have him there for some reason. It's like a crutch, somebody I can compare myself to. I hated what was being said that Larry was better than me and I'm just a guy who can control the game. My first four or five years, that bothered me a lot. I didn't tell nobody it bothered me, but it did. He was a star when, when he first arrived here, coming off the NC2A game. And quickly, during that first season, um, he became one of the stars in town. But that game put him on another level. That made him the star in town. <laughs> It's funny how I wanted to meet the celebrities, but they wanted to meet me. I was like shocked. Like, well, how'd you know who I am? He was young, famous, and after Lakers owner Jerry Buss signed him to a 25-year, $25, $25 million contract, very rich. The kid from Lansing was ready to sample a different kind of fruit. His playboy boss knew all the ripest trees. I said, oh, I'm hanging with him. 
when they were coming into the box, and he had 10, 20 of them, and look, Irvin, which one you want? And I was like, oh, okay, it's like that? <laughs> and then he said, I'm going to take you to the Playboy Mansion. What? The mansion? No, you're kidding. He said, yep. So I went there, and my first time, I'm bagging up like, I can't believe I'm in, but I'm bagging up away. You know, it's like, I'm scared to death. Probably 10 guys to 100 women, you know. Everybody think it's sex-driven, but it's really not. You, you, you have dinner, then you watch the latest movie. And then, of course, I don't want to ever say that sex wasn't involved, because if you meet somebody, and that's what you know you wanted to do, you did that. But it's really a, a great experience to go up there. So, yeah, I had fun there. But part of sports is and in connection with the celebrity culture. And Magic was perfect for it. He was a born star with that wonderful smile. And Magic knows how to work the house. <laughs> Magic knows how to work an audience. Magic, magic is a showman. So it was kind of like a very chic thing to do. <laughs> all those top agents, all the top stars, all the top producers, you'd look around that court, court side, and it was a real scene. Among the famous faces in the crowd were Bruce Willis and Don Johnson. Bruce was starring in Moonlighting, while Don had one of the biggest hits of the decade, Miami Vice. Also part of the scene was John Travolta. He was coming off the 70s disco hit Saturday Night Fever and starring in the 80s follow-up, Staying Alive. Charlie Sheen had a spot on Celebrity Row. He was in the quintessential 80s film, Wall Street, where it was said that greed is good. And through it all, there was Jack Nicholson. After going crazy in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, Jack was calmly sitting courtside after The Shining. Magic Johnson was the key that turned the engine, that ran that Porsche, that went up and down the Hollywood Hills. We wanted some razzle-dazzle and showtime team. Magic was perfect for that. He was born for that. Playing in the form was, I guess, like an audition in Hollywood. I remember mean, before I became a Laker, competing against them, it's like when they stepped out on the court. It was just instant entertainment. You had to walk past rows of, of stretch limos in the parking lot. It was like the Academy Awards every night. Every Hollywood celebrity wants to be a famous athlete. It could happen only in Los Angeles, where all the great stars came out all the time. The whole L.A. deal, Jack Nicholson, Diane Cannon. You knew you were watching something that doesn't happen all the time. You just knew it. You just knew you were in the presence of greatness, and you relished it. Yeah, you know, you know. Oh, shit. Sit back, man. Just sit back while I kick this gangster shit for you bitches. Yeah, yeah. I'm bring the bitch so you niggas how to do this. Long Island, Staten. I love the hood. That's my action. That's my kind of party. You can't catch me sleep. I keep guns on me. You couldn't do me nothing. Never step to me. That's word to my kids. You be like, oh, shit. It's on. It's on, nigga. And I broke the switch. Yeah, like the drama don't stop the stuff. It's on. It's yeah. not a question if the motherfucking things is popping. The only question is, do y'all really want drama? I doubt that. You're not about that, about that. Nigga, they'll found you dead. I doubt your head with that dark red shit. Ain't no homo shit, but niggas get wet. Ain't no fag shit. With my gun and leave niggas fucked and badly touch niggas up. Yo, who wants some? Come get it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come fit it with bulletproof hats and bulletproof jackets. Nigga, I aim for murder. Bang my third up. All up in your vitals. Hang that bullshit up. Fool, you get lit up like 42nd in Broadway with your bitch ass. Nigga, I stand up. And I broke the switch, nigga, the drama don't stop, it stays on, it's on. And I broke the switch, so it never turned off, it's straight war, it's on. And I broke that switch, nigga, the drama don't stop, it stays on. Stabbing everybody, J-Love, fuck that, we stabbing everybody. Back up from us, man, get the fuck back. What up, Black? You know what I'm saying, ALC, Liggity. first infantry shit, nigga, the bitch ass nigga. Trying to bring the biz with kids. <laughs> It's the rules of the game right here. We taking eyes. Back the fuck up. Get the fuck away from us. What 
up, Big Vic, Vic, my man Big Dream. You know that's all our guardians right there. And it's the cutting room floor. Shit that don't pass the cutting floor. Now he came to L.A. like the Pied Piper. You know, people were giving him this and giving him that. But, you know, he stayed pretty grounded to the game. Everybody was getting high then. But you can't even smoke a joint around Magic. He had real old school, down in the trenches, work ethic. And that was honed in him by his dad, Irvin Johnson Sr. Magic was always this guy, you know. He never did none of that, so I did everything for him. Magic Johnson was living on a natural high. He was starring in the role of a lifetime, point guard of a Hollywood team with an offense called Showtime. Showtime. Magic Johnson, as the director and star of Showtime, the Lakers captured five NBA titles during the 1980s. Competition drives me. He's backing in, he's down the middle, he's going to the hole, he'll shoot it back. Competition makes me, you know, play this game the way I play it. The Magic wants it more, dribble behind the back. Oh, what a play! Slam dunk! Competition makes me get out there and practice five or six hours. Trying to be the best that I can be. Showtime was coming down on a fast break. Looking left. And throwing right. Showtime was, you know, coming down. You know, kicking it to somebody. Then they said, no, nah, I don't have a shot. Kicking it to somebody else. No, nah, I don't have it. Kicking it to somebody else. And finally somebody cut. Bam, dunk. But if anyone could dim Showtime's dazzle, it was Larry Bird and company. Three times in four years, the NBA's two leading lights met in the finals. And the heat generated by their rivalry was felt across the nation. Their competitive dislike emerged from a greater truth, that on the court, they were doppelgangers. Team-oriented stars who cared about winning above all else. Basketball savants who fused the substance of the 60s with the style of the 70s to create a new and exciting yet selfless way to play the game in the 1980s. Yeah, I'm gonna pass. But I'm gonna pass in a way to make you look like a jackass. They were so similar in the way they competed. I mean, they were two halves of the same brain. Same craziness to excel. I seen that first couple of days I was with him. Basketball IQ off the chart. Seen the game a little different, most players. Playing the game the right way was everything. A lot of guys can just score. A lot of guys can just rebound. A lot of guys can just make plays. We can do it all. Larry and Magic could control the game with 12 shots. It was amazing. They'd be 7 for 12. They'd have 20 points, 15 rebounds, and 12 assists. And you go, man, the guy shot the ball 12 times and was the best player on the court by far. But I think it was tough at first. I don't think either one of them wanted to recognize that they had any equal anywhere in what they did. But they sure as hell didn't want to recognize that their equal happened to be that other guy. That's why we hated each other, too, because we knew we were mirrors of each other. I think for a while, the two of them had, they had to come to grips with that. They had begun changing the game. We were able to change not only basketball, but we were able to change the NBA, too. When the NBA and CBS signed a new TV deal, for the 82-83 season, the rescue plan was simple. Sell more bird and magic, and sell them not just as ball players, but as arch rival characters in their own dramatic saga. You got this slick showtime African-American guy out west, and you got the lunch bucket, floppy haired white guy with the bruises all over his body. It's central casting, it's perfect. I mean, this was like made in heaven. In 1979, this idea of magic and bird was created, and so that was sort of a no-brainer. We'd have a doubleheader. It would be the Celtics playing first and the Lakers playing second, and that's the way we did it. And when the Celtics and Lakers both reached the finals just a year into the new TV deal in 1984, it appeared the superstar investment was about to pay off. It was huge. It was probably the biggest moment the NBA had up to that point. You had Boston and L.A., East against West. It had all the elements of, of a classic showdown. Including what was becoming the most inescapable element of all. Did we know that the blacks and whites were lining up, the whites with the Celtics, the blacks with... Of course we knew that. 
even in the Celtics' own backyard. They land at Logan Airport at the 84 finals. He's getting accosted by various people who are telling him Larry's going to take him down. But this one older African-American gentleman comes up to me and goes, Magic, I want to wish you well, good luck. I want you to crush the Celtics. And he said, oh, well, where are you from? He said, well, I'm from Boston. And he said, you're from Boston and you're rooting for the Lakers? I thought everybody here was crazy about the Celtics. And he looked right at me and said, now why would I root for those white boys? Boston, after all, was a town still scarred by the ugly busing crisis of the mid-70s. A violent period of urban unrest during which white had been pitted against black. The resulting taint on the city nationally, coupled with a Boston roster littered with white players, affirmed to many black Americans that the Celtics were not the team for them. Even today, people said, you played with the Celtics. And, you know, I hated you at that time. You know, I, I wanted Magic to win. I didn't want that damn Larry Bird to win. We had all these black players, but they looked at us because we had Larry Bird leading us as a team that was white. The Lakers and the Celtics really didn't like each other, and it kept fans attracted to it. It kept fans enthralled. And the fact that, that every time they were asked to perform, Magic and Bird really did, only heightened it. It was the East Coast versus the West Coast. Celtic pride versus Laker tradition. It was Bird versus Magic. The most hellacious competitors going at each other. They'll kill each other out of the court. Whatever it takes to win. Magic always needed that. We needed each other. We made each other get better and better. We made each other have to go practice in the summertime because I knew Larry Bird was shooting two, three hundred jumpers a day. So that made me have to do it. This is this guy's going to be a nag or a thorn in my side for a long time. There was something that made Larry Bird and Magic Johnson kindred spirits in their respect for the game, their respect for the way it should be played. The Larry and Magic rivalry caught the attention of fans across the country. One of them was the urban black kid from Michigan, and the other one was the, you know, manure-kicking country boy from Indiana. I mean, that was perfect. That's central casting. Your person you measured yourself against was Larry Bird. What a pass, Magic Johnson. I probably wish all guys and all players had an opportunity to play in the championship and play against the play with the Lakers or the Celtics during that time. Uh, then they then they understand what basketball really is. Mm. They were perfect archetypes for what was becoming the biggest story in sports. But for the real life players, the narrative was much simpler. It's finally gonna happen. We get to go head to head again. It's just a matter of rolling that ball out there and let's get it on. Welcome then to the Boston Garden and the start of the NBA World Championship Series. I'm Brent Musburger. In each of the last four NBA World Championship Series, either Magic or Bird has competed. But this is the first time that the two have gone head to head for the title. Man, we jumped out on them that first game, and we won in Boston. And with less than a minute to go in game two, the Lakers were closing in on a commanding series lead. From that point on, things began to crumble. Down to nine seconds. Magic rolls the ball. Magic trying to work on Maxwell. Magic has still got it down to two seconds. One second. He's going to have to shoot it. He doesn't get it off. Cheesy Johnson dribbling the timeout. <laughs> what? what are you doing? The Lakers regained their stride in game three, only to be rudely knocked off it again in game four. And now let's watch it. Cooper and the Celtics, and now the bench is empty. When Kurt Rambis got taken out, we started fighting and started playing. Kareem. Swings the elbow, and now is yelling at Larry Bird. Jaw to jaw. 
and it made us realize we were not mentally tougher than the Celtics. Magic's just not himself. To be sure they won't let the time run out as they did in game two. Harris steals the ball and the Celtics pull a timeout. There are a number of places where, you know, Irvin didn't do what people expected him to do. Tied at 123. He misses the first. Johnson misses them both. Celtics want a timeout. Respondent, Magic Johnson goes to the bench. Bird turnaround hits. Game five went to the Celtics. Game six to the Lakers. It was like 1979 all over again. Down to one game for Bird and Magic. If everybody had to look at it, it probably would have said this is going to be seven game series. You know, I thought we'd sweep them in four, but uh, it's went a little bit longer. Now we just have to do it in seven. That's the only time I ever felt that. There ain't no way they're walking out here with a win. Magic Johnson. No way. Lakers have several chances, and here's Larry Bird chucking down the cross. Bird. with the ball. The Lakers trying to cut it to one. And he loses it. The Boston Celtics are the NBA world champions. I pride myself in, in being the guy who's going to win it for us and and deliver under pressure. And um, it didn't happen. Game seven of the 84 series was one of CBS's highest rated telecasts of the year and the highest rated game the NBA had ever produced. All of a sudden, whether it was at CBS or Madison Avenue, the sports writers around the country became phenomenal. What is happening here? The absolute foundation in this resurgence was the Celtics and the Lakers, Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. But Magic was in no mood to bask in the accomplishment. I took up a, a media beating. Tragic Magic. This is why we say Larry Bird is better. It's probably the first time ever in my life I was depressed. And I didn't want people to see me. It was something I never dealt with in my life. I hope he was hurt and hope it killed him. He made some bad plays down the stretch, and nobody in there was happier than me. You know, not only when the game makes you feel good, but just knowing the other guy's suffering, and you know he was. I remember after the game that both he and I uh, were in the showers crying and stayed in there for about 35, 40 minutes. It was hard because not only had we lost to the Boston Celtics, he had lost to his nemesis, Larry Bird. I think he just made me dislike him more, you know, because he was that good. And, and I think you, you, you'd be jealous. You, you're jealous a little bit. Larry, does this get you even with magic for what happened between Michigan State and Indiana State all those many years ago? Yeah, we're professionals now, but uh, I want this one for Terry Hope. Well, it was a big deal. I remember asking Quinn Buckner about it afterwards. They had a celebration in downtown Boston after they won the championship. And, you know, it was unusual for Larry to have these little outbursts, as Quinn would call them. but. You know, about 11.30 at night, finally he turned to Quinn, he goes, I got him. I finally got him. And he was talking about magic. In 1984, the Celtics claimed first championship blood from the Lakers in the war between Magic and Bird. While the Boston Stars' 27-point average lifted his team to a seven-game victory, Johnson made ill-advised decisions in the closing minutes of the fourth quarter and overtime losses in games two and four. Every year, that was the thought. We're going to get Boston this year, and I think it became even more so in 84. Uh, we had them on the ropes, and it turned out to our dismay. And I always remember sitting in Boston Garden in the shower of magic, and we were like, man, we had that, but you know what? The fun thing about this rivalry and this game is that there's always next year. You crazy. <laughs> 
I said, you're crazy. I'm not shooting a commercial with Larry. So I said, okay, what, we're going to shoot in L.A.? I would never went to L.A. to film it. Well, where are we going to shoot it? My plan was that. made a pair of bird shoes for last year's MVP. Yep. When they made a pair of magic shoes for this year's MVP. Okay, Magic, show me what you got. Even after Converse had convinced Magic and Bird to film a sneaker ad together in the summer of 85, a question remained. How would the two hated rivals on the court get along off of it? I don't know how he's going to react. I don't know how I'm going to react. We didn't even shake hands, so how are we going to do a commercial together? The ad was to be filmed at the home Bird had built for his mom. It featured a full-length basketball court, the day's first location. So they say, okay, you're playing one-on-one, -on -one, and I'm looking at Larry, and he's looking at me like, is this real? Are we playing, playing? Because, you know, this, this, is, this is magic and Bird. I could just hear Larry, you know, starting in on, well, you bring it to the basket, and I'm going to send it 30 rows up. So the guy was like, no, no, not like that. A fun game. We were both like, oh, okay. Like, <laughs> like you can see this relief coming over both of our faces. That brief detente led to the next stage, dialogue. We sat down next to each other. How was your summer? Oh, it's going good. How was yours? It's going great. I said, man, it's a nice spread you got. He's asked me, is this where you play? I said, yeah, I play here if it's not windy. If it's raining or windy, I go to the gym. But this is where I do all my work. I see that tractor. You work on the, on the tractor? He said, man, I work on this tractor every day. Larry Bird work on a tractor? He said, yeah. It's just them two walking and talking. And every once in a while, they'd stop, and one of them would say something, and then they'd start laughing. Then they said, OK, break. It's lunch break time. I was going to my trailer. He said, no, my mother has prepared lunch for us up at the house. We went up to the house, and we sat down there, and we talked. And my mom, my brothers thought the world of him. His mother was so nice making sure I had enough to eat. I just saw my mother. It was crazy. He charmed her. You can see it. But that's magic. He makes everybody feel welcome and warm, and he's a con man. <laughs> and while magic charmed Georgia Bird, it was someone else who intrigued her son. He met Irvin at lunch. Irvin was a good dude. I like Irvin a lot better than Magic. I was just so happy to finally be Irvin with him because Magic was like, I don't know if I want to get to know this guy. But Irvin got a chance to talk about family, how he grew up. We just, we just became two relaxed guys just talking. That day was great. It was a great day, beautiful day. Still for Bird, ever the competitor, that's all it was, just one day. Magic thinks the next year, okay, well, now we're great friends. So, you know, after the game, we're going to go out, we're going to have a, a beer. And Larry's like, no, you're right. I know you better. You're a good guy, but I still don't want anything to do with you. He's a happy-go-lucky guy. If me and him got to be really good friends, go out on the court, he could still play the same game. I couldn't. I mean, that's just the way it is. The one-time great white hope who would further emerge as the polarizing racial figure in part to that era's increasingly conservative political climate. The rolling back institutionally of the achievements of the Civil Rights Movement were going on apace from about 1975 on. But the triumph of the movement that rolled it back took place in the 1980s. And I think there was people who were very aware in the black community of what was going on. And I think there was a lot of sublimated frustration. And I think one of the ways it got sublimated was into basketball. And I think Larry, through no fault of his own, was the receptacle within which the lingering resentments somehow floated. And after Bird led the Celtics to the championship in 1986, his third in the pros, winning his third straight MVP award in the process, the resentment grew. I always felt that the press was biased in favor of Larry Bird. It always felt to me like they were gonna make Larry the hero. You know, you'd see somebody score 
and Larry would be in a cast in a suit on the bench, and they'd say, Larry Bird made that possible a couple weeks ago when he told that guy he could do it, and, and he just did it. And they, they gonna get his motherfucker the assistant, he not in the game? Not to be racist, but we have a white guy who's the best in the world, and predominantly a black sport now, and you got a guy like Larry Bird who can't run, who can't jump, but can do everything out there. Bird may have sought to avoid the conversation entirely, but the more he won, the less he could escape it. Now there's a steal by Bird. Underneath the DJ, he lays it in. What a play by Bird. In 1987, after Boston beat the Detroit Pistons to advance to the finals for the fourth straight year, Pistons rookie Dennis Rodman called Bird overrated because he was white. His teammate Isaiah Thomas then chimed in with some thoughts of his own. I can remember uh, in the locker room, I think it was Jack McMullen came up to me and said, Isaiah just said, boom, 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 boom. And I go, so? He didn't care. He didn't care. Everybody else around him cared very deeply in the days and weeks as it turned out ahead. I mean, the media made it out like it was something, but it didn't matter to me what Isaiah or Dennis Rodman said, and it still don't. That's no bearing what I do in my life. And in 1987, as Bird vied with magic to be the best, the flap over Isaiah Thomas's racially fueled remarks forced Bird to address his least favorite topic at the worst possible time. I had to go to a press conference when I was in LA trying to get ready to play the Lakers and tell people I didn't care, this don't bother me. The main thing is if the statements or whatever was said doesn't bother me. I don't think it should bother any of us. From playing all year, trying to get back to the finals and play against Magic, this was a distraction. Magic was on a mission to prove to himself and the world that with the ball in his hands, he was still the one in control. And after his Lakers ran through the 85 season, he quickly got what he wanted. Another shot at Bird and the Celtics. They won the East, we won the West. So it's like, uh, everybody just get ready, sit back, and uh, let's enjoy it. <laughs> but that smile belied the intensity of the clash that awaited. Bird was facing off against Magic for the third time in four years. And if their relationship had softened, the determination to beat each other had not. If I had a glass of water and any of those guys had been on fire, I would have drank the water and watched them. They called us, you know, chokers and sissies. You know, we didn't like that, and they thought less of us. I knew they did. In 85, we played them four times in exhibition season for some reason. I don't know why they scheduled that. By the fourth game, there was an all-out brawl. They call this one of the greatest rivalries in all of sport, the Celtics and the Lakers. And if that is true, it is the most one-sided rivalry in all of sports. Eight times these two have met for the NBA championship, and eight times the Celtics have won. At guard in his sixth year for Michigan State, at number 32, Magic Johnson. But in the 85 finals, Magic changed the script. Over six grueling games, he masterfully controlled the pace with all-around brilliance. He has a triple-double again. Behind their point guard, the Lakers finally knocked out the Celtics, winning the clinching game in the Boston Garden. Three in six years, L.A. comes to Boston and wins the world title. For redemption for one Magic Johnson. It's a long year last year to wait for this moment right now. Magic had evened the score with Bird on the NBA floor, but the significance of their rivalry and their relationship was still just taking hold. As game four proved, the level of competition between them was higher than ever. Bird played awesome down the stretch of that game. Trailing 2-1 in the series, the Celtics were down by one point in the final minute of the game. But Larry Bird wouldn't be easily vanquished. Open his aim.
With seven seconds left, though, the Lakers still had life. Three years earlier in the 84 finals, Magic had flubbed a similar situation. But this was a different Magic, one with a whole new bag of tricks. My man switched to Kareem, and Kevin McHale jumped out to me. And as soon as I saw Kevin, I said, oh, I'm taking him. You know, Magic puts it on the floor, a couple head and shoulder fakes, and he raised up in the air, and there was nobody that was going to get that shot. I remember after they called timeout thinking, there's still a shot here. Celtics may still win this game. Well, they set up a great play. Bird walked Worthy all the way up, forced the denial all the way up. We, we've done it before. Clear everybody out, go to the ball, break the corner. He caught it here, and as he caught it, all he had to do was turn. He just turned, and he just let this thing go. Bird fires it. Got a wide open look, couldn't believe it. And I'm standing right there, it is straight as an arrow. Dead on. And the Lakers have won. They were lucky because it was right on line. He looked at me like, how did you ever leave me that wide open? <laughs> you got to be kidding me. Changed the whole series. The Lakers won the series in six. And in the aftermath of a year in which Magic had won his first MVP, the rivalry suddenly took on a new tone. Magic's just a great basketball player. He's the best I've ever seen, you know. I... Unbelievable. I don't know what to say. I was shocked that he said it, because I thought to myself, maybe this is the beginning of a new era that's not going to include him. It was the passing of the torch a little bit. After vanquishing Bird in 87, Magic wasn't done winning. The following year, he squared off in the finals against his good friend Isaiah Thomas and the Pistons, beating them to become the NBA's first repeat champions in two decades. By the dawn of the 90s, he'd won five titles, played in eight finals, and equaled Bird's MVP tally of three. But the more Magic won, the less Irvin seemed to be around to reap the spoils. Once I tasted the champagne and the championship, I wanted more of that and more of that. So magic kept growing because we were successful. In 1985, L.A. beat Boston in six games. The interior private war between magic and bird shed no light on who was better. Johnson recorded a pair of triple doubles and dished out a finals record 84 assists, while bird averaged 24 points. It wasn't easy stopping Showtime, you know. They say when they got running, there wasn't a whole lot you could do. When they got out and got in their groove, it was just a, just racehorse basketball at its best. And Magic was just um, a great guy in the middle of the break, making great decisions. He doesn't make that shot. The series is tied 2-2. If the Celtics win at home in game five, they take a 3-2 lead back to L.A., and they just need to get one of the remaining two games. And they might they might well have done it. That's the biggest basket of Magic Johnson's career. To the left goes Magic. I pride myself in being uh, one of the best players to ever play in this game in a clutch situation. Number one thing, competition and winning. You know I love them rings. <laughs> so nothing like winning. Magic was so serious and dedicated to his game. And he was a crazy, crazy competitor and a crazy man. Irvin, I think, is the smiling kid from Lansing. I think Irvin died about 25 minutes after the NCAA championship game. Irvin doesn't have the ego that Magic has. Magic got a crazy ego, and winning is everything. Magic became a legend with his three finals MVPs and three regular season MVPs. Heck, the guy won finals MVP as a rookie. He had the opportunity to play with some of the all-time greats, but rather than riding their coattails to history, he had five all-time and win shares for the playoffs. He truly earned his spot in history. Wow. What was Irvin Johnson's vice? 
Now you know my publicist wants me to say Winnie. But women loved her. Back then, before voicemail, they used to have these mail slots in the hotels where you leave your key. And when we get into a town, Irvin's mail slot would be so packed, and it would be just Susan and a phone number, Linda and a phone number, Joyce and a phone number. I mean, that was every city, every, every time. I was on top of my game as magic. So I needed all that around me at that time. The women, the this, the that, Hollywood. Magic was living in a context of sybaritic excess from the minute he walked in the door. And he developed a sweet tooth for it. Sex with several women at the same time. Yeah. Like I said, women have different fantasies. Some want to be with two or three at a time. Hard. And hard. <laughs> and, um... With one or more women. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I meant one or more at the same time. At the same time, yeah. yes. You know, one time I had six at one time. And so I think that they made their decision. I really do believe he looks upon Magic Johnson as a movie character he played. I think Irvin got overwhelmed in L.A. by what it meant to be a star. That's probably true that um, the Magic ego swallowed Irvin a little bit, but that's okay because I couldn't win five championships without that. Through all of this haze of, of women and money and fame and fortune, he still kept basketball at number one. He never seemed to lose that focus. And that's exactly what's happened because, you know, Magic could be the mayor of Los Angeles. He could be the governor of California. That's how much the state loves him and that's how much he loves this town. My dad knew he was the ultimate matchmaker and uh, they really were I think the most special relationship between an owner and a player that's ever been and probably ever will be. Magic Johnson spoke publicly for the first time about him contracting HIV. I'm sleeping really, laying down, just waiting on the game and uh, their phone rings and uh, The voice says, hey, you got to uh, come back to L.A. And uh, I said, okay, why? Well, I can't tell you until you get to L.A. So I said, okay. Two hours later, he was in the office of Lakers team physician Michael Melman. Dr. Melman starts to tell me that, you know, uh, through the physical that I took, that um, they discovered that I had HIV. First time ever in my life, I'm such a control freak, right? And do things the right way. I'm out of control. Oh, it was everything. How is it possible? What happened? How did it happen to me? And my mind is racing, you know, and uh, and then you just you just devastated. I'm thinking Urban's gonna get skinny and die. I mean, literally, that's what I thought. Urban's gonna get skinny and die. The first person I thought of was Larry. I wonder what Larry thinks. The day that I heard about magic, it just sort of changed my love for basketball. It shook me up. You know, you get, a, you get that feeling, probably the same type of feeling I had when my father died. He wants to understand why, you know, how can I talk to him? How, I need to speak to him. It was just really important for Larry to talk to him. You know, it, <laughs> you know, it's sort of, I don't know. I wanted to hear it from him, but I didn't believe it. Calls me and uh, we're talking. You know, it's just how you doing. I heard about it, and uh, you can almost hear both of us with some uh, tears in our eyes. And I'm choked up because he did call me, and uh, you know, when something happens.
to you. And then you find out who really your friends are and people who really care about you. Um, you figure all those battles, all those things we had to go through as warriors, as competitors, then as men. And um, here this man says, hey, you know what, man, you okay. And so um, that was the greatest moment for me, too, you know, to have him check on me and, and to make sure I was okay. First of all, let me say good, a good after late afternoon. Um, because of uh, the HIV virus that I have, attained, uh, I will have to retire from the Lakers. When you talk about letting the air out of a balloon, having a crash landing, uh, there's no words to define what that meant to this franchise, what that meant to those of us that were so close to him. We do not, you know, want to eulogize him. You know, we want to now give him you know, all the love and support and prayers and all the other people that are afflicted uh, by this insidious disease. AIDS was synonymous with death. And I think that's immediately what everybody feared, is that magic was going to die. Everyone was afraid for him personally. I just didn't want to see this bubbly, enthusiastic guy suddenly not be that way anymore. And that was my greatest concern for him. It wasn't the basketball part of it. At the time that Magic Johnson announced that he was HIV positive, the prevailing medical intelligence was that by this time, Magic Johnson would either be a pathetic, dying man, barely recognizable physically, or he'd already be dead. It was just like knowing someone that's got cancer. That's cancer that's run throughout their entire body. You, you know they're going to die. It's just a matter of time. You know? Reporters cry. I mean, we thought this guy was in total denial. I plan on going on, living for a long time, bugging you guys like I've always have. We thought this, this smile was going to be wiped off his face forever and he was going to die, but we're going to watch him die in public. I just remember in the room, he was joking, and I'm sitting there looking at him crying, and he's like, Coop, man, I'm going to be okay. I'm going to be okay. It's going to be all right. I am going to go on, I'm going to beat it, and I'm going to have fun. Sure, come on. You, you're going to beat this? And to him, it was a contest. Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, AIDS and Magic Johnson, it's the same thing. It's just a, a, a different game, different rules, but I'm still going to win. He wasn't planning on going nowhere. Urban was planning that day to find the right medicine, to eat right, get rest, and live forever. That's what he was planning. Thank you again, and I'll see you soon. But as Magic put up a positive public face, his nemesis, still out of sorts, shed the mask he had hidden behind for years. He was visibly like, wow, how could that happen? You know, it just that it was just, it really set him back. Probably the two toughest days I've had since my father passed away. And I've been very depressed and, and sort of been out of it. I listened to him talk in this press conference about how devastated he was. And I remember thinking to myself, you know, God damn, Larry found Urban. You know, just out of the blue, something like that happening. It's just never had uh, other than one other instance I didn't, and I was hoping I'd never see that again because I remember how I felt weeks after that and yesterday was just, just a sad day and at his game that night Bird was forced to confront pain he couldn't so easily play through didn't want to be there that night first time ever and really last I remember we played in Atlanta had no feel for the game, you know. This wasn't, wasn't a good time to be out there. Never had that before. That night, he threw a pass. I'll never forget, he threw a half-court pass behind his back for a layup. And if you blurred your eyes, you squinted your eyes, it looked like magic. And that was Larry saying goodbye. You know, I mean, this competition thing is, is, a, is amazing, what it does to you. 
what you put your body through and what you do and what you say and how you feel and knowing that he's not there wouldn't feel right. But I think it's all them years that, you know, what's he doing? What if he's practicing this hard? I bet he shot 500 shots a day and I didn't get 500 in. It's always that mind games. Bird played through the 91-92 season, his last in the NBA, but a part of him was already gone. I didn't check the papers anymore, you know, it didn't matter. Uh, I still wanted to compete, you know, but uh, it wasn't the same, it really wasn't. And on top of that, I learned quickly how differently I'd be looked at now that I had HIV. With the exception of that year when he was called Tragic Johnson, because on the basketball court, things didn't shake down properly, this is the first time I'm hearing ignorance. Magic Johnson was not a hero. He admitted his lifestyle, and anybody with that kind of lifestyle really isn't a hero. Hatred. There was some of my former teammates who had their own little things that they were talking about and why this happened to me. You know anybody else that's heterosexually got it? Come on, man. You in denial. I've been called gay, faggot, urban's lover. I've been called all that shit. Lon Rosen got a call from Isaiah Thomas asking, you know, I keep hearing Magic's gay. And Lon said, well, for crying out loud, you know better than anybody he hasn't. You're one of his best friends. And he said, well, we don't know what's going on in Hollywood. And the fact that Isaiah was questioning why he got this, I think it was really, really hurtful to him. He used to say, you know, I don't want people to stop shaking my hand and giving me my hugs. He loves to be loved. And um, that's what bothered him the most, that people would change in relationship to him. He would show up at the Lakers facility to work out and to shoot some baskets, and he'd try to engage his teammates and say, hey, you want to play a little one-on-one -on -one before practice? And, oh, geez, no, I can't. I got to go get taped. Or, oh, geez, I got work to do. I got to do something else. In Jack McCallum's forthcoming book on the Dream Team, Clyde Drexler made some very candid comments uh, suggesting that you received undue accolades shortly after you announced that you had HIV. I know you were unaware of these comments, right. uh, so I want to read them to you. He said, uh, very candid, he said, everybody kept waiting for magic to die. Every time he'd run up the court, everybody would feel sorry for the guy. And he said that you were on the declining end of your career at that time period, and if it hadn't been for your diagnosis, he would have been the MVP that year. Mm -hmm. Is that a fair statement? You know, I think that, you know, Clyde, I mean, if that's how he felt, that's how he felt, you know. Um, um, I think that uh, Clyde was a guy who always fought for more publicity, um, a guy who probably thought that he should have deserved more credit. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want any sympathy. The only thing I wanted was to be treated the same way you treated me before you knew I had HIV. You know, a lot comes out after the fact that, I mean, here it is 20 years later, and now you want to make these comments 20 years later. Now, I know Clyde, you know, <laughs> sure you I know too. Clyde. So this is really funny you want to make these comments 20 years later but at the end of the day I got to take the high road I don't have time to worry about what a guy felt like but you had a chance to say these things to me or if you you had a problem with it you could, should have came out with it at that time uh, and then instead of hiding behind a book you know don't never I'm never gonna hide behind anything you know I'm gonna tell you what time it is and I'm gonna tell you uh, how I feel the difference between Clyde and I is that I figure out a way how to win. I don't, I don't sit back and ever say, hmm, well, the guy you gave him all the sympathy and I should have been the MVP. I never say that. Uh, all the times that I should have won, do you know how many times I should have won? <laughs> you know how many times I could say I, I could have done this? I'm not that guy. When I see Clyde, I'm going to hit him, hug him. And man, how you doing? How the family? How your wife? You know, I, I would never mention this because it, it doesn't mean anything to me. I just got to keep moving forward, you know. 
vicious, nasty thing. There is a developing story that we need to address. The NBA is investigating racist remarks allegedly made by L.A. Clippers owner Donald Sterling in a phone call with his girlfriend. It's an audio tape obtained by TMZ. In that conversation, the man believed to be Sterling takes issue with his girlfriend posting a picture of herself with Magic Johnson and posting it on Instagram saying, quote, I admire Magic Johnson. Too bad you can't admire him privately and, and during your entire life. Fuck you, you fucking moron. Not only has he not apologized, but he lashed out at you in a big way, Magic, and really said some terrible things. Magic Johnson, you know, has made a public comment. What, do you have something to say to him? What, what could I say to him? He, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I'm, I'm hurt, but it doesn't matter. You're hurt that he, that he said that he spoke out publicly. He's got to come down hard. He shouldn't own a team anymore. And he should stand up and say, I don't want to own a team anymore, especially when you have African-Americans renting his apartments, coming to the games, and playing for him, and coaching for him. Uh, this, is, this is bad for everybody. It's bad for America, and, and so uh, I'm really upset about it. It's obviously appalling, it's very disturbing, and there's no doubt about it that the league itself, Adam Silva specifically, has to take action. This is the first big test of Adam Silva, and he's got to suspend this guy. He has to suspend this guy. I don't know that young lady. I took a picture, and all of a sudden, I'm in the middle of this mess. But at the same time, I would not let you attack me without responding. I felt proud to be covering a league that handled a situation like this as definitively um, and as boldly as it did today, Chuck. Hey, man, I, I, I was in shock today. I ain't going to even lie, Ernie. I was sitting there. I built my whole today. I've got to be in front of my television at 2 o'clock. And when he said, I am banning Mr. Sterling for life from any association with the Clippers organization or the NBA. I said, wow. I mean, here is a man who's, I don't know if I say this, he, he acts so holy. I mean, he, he made love to every girl in every city in, in America, and he had AIDS. And when he had those AIDS, I went to my synagogue and I prayed for him. I hoped he could live and be well. I didn't criticize him. I could have. Is he an example for children? You know, because he has money, he's able to treat himself. But Magic Johnson is irrelevant in this thing. He didn't do anything harmful to anybody. And I respect him and I admire everything that he does. You know, I'd like to help even more if he would offer me an opportunity to help. I like to help minorities. Knocks you in the head with a brick, knocks you to the ground, stomps you in the face, take that you crack ass motherfucker, take that you crack ass motherfucker, take that you crack ass motherfucker, motherfucker. What has he done? Can you tell me? Big Magic Johnson, what has he done? Well, he has, he's a business person. He, uh, he's got AIDS. Take that you crack ass motherfucker, crack ass motherfucker, crack ass motherfucker. Did he do any business? I like, did he help anybody in South L.A.? Well, I think he has HIV. He doesn't actually have full-blown AIDS. But. Uh, well, what kind of a guy goes to every city, has sex with every girl, then he catches HIV? And uh, Is that someone we want to uh, respect and, and tell our kids about? I think he should be ashamed of himself. I think he should go into the background. But what does he do for the black people? doesn't do anything. You know, that's his opinion if he thinks I'm not a role model. That's his own opinion. But I know the things that I've done in urban America and for people. You call up and think, well, you he's, know, he's, the opened, a business, he's, he's a, opened a lot of businesses in, Jewish in inner city neighborhoods. I mean, I sent over 10,000 minorities to college. I got 150 of those students on scholarship right now. Uh, what does he do? Work for the Dodgers? Well, I think he got a little wrong. I'm the owner of the Dodgers. So you're saying that African Americans don't contribute to their to African American communities as much as Jewish. There's people no do. African American. Never mind. I'm sorry. Cracker ass cracker. Cracker ass cracker. I'll put my foot in the cracker ass cracker ass cracker. I wish that cracker would have said some shit to me. Saltine ass motherfucking cracker. Two mother. Two motherfucker. Cracker, kiss my ass, you fucking cracker!
message to the motherfucker that owned the Clippers. You bitch ass, redneck, white bread, chicken shit motherfucker. Fuck you, your mama, and everything connected to you, you racist piece of shit. Fuck you. Ah, uh, you know, there's a lot of bad things. You know, it's like, you know, the parties and the, and the, you know, the girls and, you know, whatever, all that. Most of that time, I wasn't here, and that's why I wasn't here. His partying had always been legendary, frankly. Imagine he's such a good guy, such a nice guy. He was almost like a Babe Ruth, and a lot of things that happened off the court just weren't written about. There was a room at the forum, sort of a side room that belonged, it was like a sauna room. And that room kind of belonged to Jamal after games. And, you know, he would have, I guess he'd have women come in after the games and unwind that way. But when Jamal retired, that room got bequeathed to Magic. And so Magic would have his guys, from what I understand, would have his guys kind of shoot, find a woman in their audience who kind of suited him or, or he had some woman who was coming to the game and then they would meet him in this room after the game. And Magic, he would always be the last guy in the locker room. Always have a smile on his face. There's an infidelity in pro sports. There's, a, I think, an acceptance that is really disturbing. Because these guys are so-called superheroes, they're supposed to be superheroes sexually, too. What his situation did was it opened the eyes to everybody else in the league, and I think everybody who's living that type of lifestyle. As shockwaves from Magic's disclosure radiated well beyond the sports world, he was left with an even more painful task, the emotional disengagement from the Laker Brotherhood and the game that had always sustained him. The hardest thing for Urban that day was not speaking to the press and telling the world. It was going downstairs to the locker room and telling his fellow teammates that he's not going to be there anymore for them. He's not going to be on the court. That was the only time I saw Urban Johnson break down. Magic called the night before and told me that he had something that very important he wanted to say to me and to meet him at the forum, and that's when he told me. And all I could do was cry. This isn't how the movie's supposed to end. You know, the good guys are always supposed to ride off in the sunset. The day that we found out, it just seemed like the end of the world. We cried and we thought that it was over. Even with this devastation, he just said, you know what, we're going to fight this thing. And I was, I was like, okay, let's do it. He tried to be as positive as he could, and he smiled, you know, which is his usual response to everything. He said, I'm going to do it the way I've always done it which is exactly the way he handled it today, directly, honestly, and in an extraordinarily upbeat fashion, which is just magic. My father taught me strength, and I, that's what I am. I'm too strong, and I don't worry about it, I just keep going. It was this unshakable optimism that carried a new and penetrating message about AIDS to a nation in denial. To have a man like Magic Johnson come out and say, yeah, I'm, I'm HIV positive and, and watch me continue with my life, lets a lot of people realize that this is not the end of life. But civilian clothes didn't quite suit Magic. His game hadn't changed, his physical strength was uncompromised, and his will to win remained firm. Three months after announcing he was HIV positive, he took the floor at the 1992 All-Star Game. But it wouldn't be a smooth return. There were players like, like Carl Malone, like Mark Price, who weren't sure that it was safe for Magic to play. They didn't know what the, what the risks were for playing with somebody who had the HIV virus. But I think Magic Johnson overpowered that tension with his great joy, and you could see it in his face, getting out there and playing. In typical Magic fashion, he would own the day, scoring 25 points and winning the MVP. Three Seeing everybody embrace Magic at the end of the day, I think that did a lot for people's understanding and awareness of HIV. He comforted other people and said, don't worry about me, I'm gonna be fine, I'm gonna deal with this. And he was, he was still Urban Johnson. He was not, you know, broken by this. The reaction to Magic at the All-Star Game and a gold medal performance in the Olympics that summer convinced Johnson to rejoin the Lakers the following preseason. When he wanted to come back, there were people talking about whether they could play against him. There was a great debate. If I get in collision with a guy, it don't have to be Magic. It could be Joe Smoke. But the fact of the matter is, if you got the AIDS virus, 
it'll be hard for me to play as hard as I'm capable of playing. And if people can't respect my decision, that's tough. Magic's return ended before the regular season began. Magic Johnson has retired from basketball again. This time he says he will not change his mind. Johnson's decision to retire again appears to have been influenced very much by what has happened in the intervening month. In 1994, Johnson grew restless from the game of basketball and accepted an offer to coach the Lakers. Magic uh, went into coaching because uh, he always felt that I, I think, even as a player, that I can change it. He could always control it as a player. I can change it, I can make us win, I can make this play work, I can make him a better player. Don't worry, I can handle it because he was in control of it. I was going to dictate it, I'll take care of it. And then when he became a coach and he put that responsibility in the hands of immature, not as talented players, it probably was very frustrating for him. With a record of 5-11, and 11, Magic stepped down after just 16 games. But the thought that he might be done with basketball was unacceptable to him, prompting a comeback as a player in 1996. 32 games later, however, he knew that the curtain had rung down on Showtime. It took away a little bit from what he had accomplished. It wasn't just a matter of coming back once and having it not work out. It was coming back, retiring, coming back, retiring, coming back, retiring. Even if he wasn't doing it, he was talking about it. I don't think there's any question that, that had he not done the seesaw thing, that he would be held in high regard. I was privileged to know Magic as a player, and I know him now, and I can make the case he was the most beloved athlete ever in any sport. We are here for a very special moment in Laker basketball history as we honor Magic Johnson. Dominated with joy is, is like a weird, com I've never seen that combination before. Remember, he became a pariah among the, the players who... who Carl Malone said, it's going to show you also the athletes are not higher than people think they are. My feeling was dead man walking. He just wanted to play right. basketball, mm -hmm. and it got taken from him. The worst thing of all of this, that I couldn't play basketball. I don't even think dealing with HIV, it was I couldn't play. The game, the surroundings was his whole world. That's his personality. When you take that away, you know, he's, you're hurting. I knew he was hurting in a big way. This is that very moment we've been waiting for. And here it is for all to see for the first time. I never dreamed in my life that I would be up there near the great Legends, I thank Larry Bird personally for bringing the best out of Magic Johnson. Because without you, I couldn't rise to the top, and I really appreciate that. It's just been a great, wonderful 12 years with you. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have. Okay, now what? And you know what now what was. Mm -hmm. He became as great an entrepreneur as, as we've ever seen. I mean, this this man dominates. Right. He, yeah. He's dominating the business world right. the way he dominated basketball. Absolutely. It, it is stunning what this man has wrought. Changing venues from passing lanes to Wall Street, Magic had turned himself into a new kind of role model. His real estate company develops property in minority neighborhoods, and his movie theaters rank among the most profitable in the country. Do you ever play basketball with him? I always hear yeah, that he was a, a good yeah. basketball player. He talked so much trash, he thought he had a real jump shot. <laughs> you know, and so, and I had to remember it was Prince that I was playing against, so I had to bag off, yeah, right? right? You know, but he really thought he could play basketball. But one of my greatest joys was, I used to own the Magic Johnson Theaters, and he called me up and he said, Magic, I want to come to the theater. So, okay, what time do you want to come? 2 a.m. <laughs> I said, Prince, we close at 2 a.m., but okay, I'll open it for you. So we open it up, my manager and projection guy. He brings this big bus full of people. Jimmy, when they get off, they all in pajamas. <laughs> yeah. And they go to watch the movie. <laughs> and he had a what wonderful was the movie? time. You remember? No, I don't remember the movie. <laughs> but we let him have the theater, uh -huh. and he kept calling, and he kept coming back, but he was a night owl. But he was very, very intelligent, 
and he was a jokester all at the same time, you know, and so he was a good dude. And I, I toured with Michael Jackson, and I got a chance to tour with Prince. So those are the two best things I've ever done in my whole life. Yeah, right. well, those are pretty great things to yeah. do. Now, yeah. you're an owner of not only the Dodgers, as everybody knows, you own the Los Angeles Sparks, the WNBA yes. team. Yes. Well, the season's starting right, right about yeah, now. Yeah, right? we, we started our first game. We're 1-0, and uh, Candace Parker's back healthy. She's a great player, yeah, right? she is, and she got left off the Olympic team, so... She's taking that personal, and she's taking she's going to take it out on the league this if year. If you and Candace went one on one right now, who would win that game? Jimmy, come on. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there hasn't nothing changed about me. <laughs> right? If I played my daughter right now, who's 21, uh -huh. and we would go to 10, I would let her get to nine, <laughs> <laughs> and then I would crush her. I'm so used to winning, I don't know nothing else. I knew nothing else back then. Go ahead, man. Continue. No, I just no, like watching no, you talk. No, man. no. That's, that's When you talk, that's money what... comes out. So I'm, just, <laughs> I'm just trying to catch it, man. Just... <laughs> you got it. You got it. Bam! He hates to lose. <laughs> he hates to lose at anything. They may be better players, but they'll never be better winners. And that's what my whole goal was, was to win. And as a, obviously, a, he's had stakes in, in obviously the Lakers and Dodgers and the Sparks and the, the MLS team. Woo. He's, uh, he's Magic Johnson, the former Laker great, of course, and the Dodger uh, owner joining us, Dan Patrick Show. And it, it's a pleasure to know him. He has God in his heart. And, man, I love you, man, Magic. You, yeah. you, you're, you're an all-timer. You are the all-timer, too. Magic, you love Larry Bird. And here's the thing. You played him four titles, four, four titles, you won three, Bird won one. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> but your relationship is such that they're even doing a Broadway play about you and Bird. Ladies and gentlemen, playing Larry Bird, Mr. Tom Coker. And in the role of Magic Johnson, please welcome Mr. Kevin Daniels! It's an incredible night. I, uh, Tamara Tooney, a uh, good friend of mine, asked me to become an investor on this show, and I read it, and after she said Larry Bird and Magic Johnson, I said, well, you had me at Larry Bird. I am thrilled. I mean, I, our office is right down the street. I grew up in New York. I live up on the west side. Madison Square Garden is south of here, so at the epicenter of New York City on Broadway, the NBA is on the marquee, so it's a great night for me. It's a little different than I'm used to, but uh, being with Irving, uh, we don't get together a lot. Uh, I think last time I seen it was probably six, seven weeks ago, but we like to hang out a little bit and, and to watch this night will be exciting for us. How surprising do you think it is to see an NBA show debut on the Great White Way? Why not? Want to do another revival? <laughs> Sick of it. I saw them the first time around. Why do you think audiences should come out and see uh, your, your life story? Well, if you're a sports fan and you've been around long enough, I think that they know our, our story. And I think it's a great opportunity for the ladies to bring their husbands down and take a look. I'm more painful when the Lakers lose or the Dodgers lose. Well, <laughs> right now it had to be the Lakers because, you know, at least the Dodgers were off to a good start, 2-0. Uh, and oh. uh, The Lakers... Uh, I think the pain is because we've never seen the Lakers lose like they're losing this season. And I think fans are still wondering what's the plan to get back to being a championship uh, team. Well, that's just I, – I don't know what that plan is. And I every time I look at it, you may be as frustrated as anybody else. Um, but what do you think is that grand plan here that brings the Lakers back? How would you like Magic brought back in what capacity? I would like him to have complete control of basketball operations. Wow. And here is why. Because I know this much. If you are 2-15, and 15, 
Magic ain't happening. Something gonna happen. You know what I'm I, I don't know what you gonna do. Something gonna happen. I, somebody might get kidnapped. Somebody might hear my have an accident. There's a mid-level exception, a veteran. He, he's gonna do something. And I promise you, I promise you Magic Johnson would do this. He'd have a press conference just to tell Laker fans, mm -hmm. don't you worry, this is a momentary lapse. This will not last. Oh, we ain't having this. Laker Nation, I have a message for you. Happy days are here uh, again. A new day, a new era of Laker basketball. We welcome in Governor and President Jeannie Buss, Head of Basketball Operations, Irvin Magic Johnson. Thank you for being here. What can you share with us that led you to this point? Well, first of all, I think that uh, coming back just to the organization that I love, the Lakers, and then I've known this woman who has been put in charge by her father, Jeannie Buss, and when we sat down for dinner and she asked me to come back, uh, I think the timing was right. I re-energized everybody that works for the Laker organization and make sure our fans understand that, you know, we're here to win. Jeannie has always dedicated her life to winning and to making sure that the Laker fans are happy with the product that's on the floor. Jeannie, how hard was this for you on a personal level because it involves your brother Jim and Mitch who you've known for most of your life? This um, was a very difficult decision. Um, it was probably so hard for me to make that I probably waited too long. And um, for that, I apologize mm -hmm. to Laker fans. Um, but um, now with clarity and direction and, and after uh, talking with Irvin, really knowing that uh, a change was needed and that's why we're here today. You mentioned waiting some time. Is that because you wanted to give Jim his three to four year timeline in, in almost its entirety? Um, I wanted, I wanted um, you know, uh, for the current front office um, to have the, their opportunity to show us what Laker basketball was going to be. And um, there, it just wasn't going in a direction that was satisfactory for what this organization stands for. In Magic, over the last couple of weeks, what did you learn about where the organization was headed where you knew you wanted to get in there and, and start to make things happen? Well, it, it really wasn't about the last couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. It's, it's been about the years, mm -hmm. right? And I think, first of all, I wanted to work side by side with Jeannie. And I think that um, if it was probably any other situation, I probably wouldn't have, you know, left my business aside, left my business to concentrate fully 150% on Laker business. It, but because of her leadership, and I know she wants to win so bad, uh, that I decided, hey, I want to work side by side with her. This is an exciting time. I, 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 I'm, I told my wife, Cookie, I said, I can't believe it. I, it's 1979, I get picked by the Lakers. I jumped and screamed. I said, I can't believe I'm getting ready to play with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, <laughs> right? And then I get off the plane, and here's Dr. Buzz Genie's dad sitting there waiting on me, and we hit it off, and thank God he took me in like I was his son, and we were brought up together. Uh, brothers and sisters, and then he said, okay, if you can write a check, I'm going to let you be owner. So I said, okay, here's the check, Dr. Buss, and he allowed me to be owner when he didn't have to. And then I was there, Jeannie called me, said, you know, my dad want to see you, and uh, she thought it was that time, and we, I stayed in that room for hours, and we laughed as he, uh, in his final days, and then for her to say, Irvin, uh, I want to entrust you. I, I believe in you. I'm going to put this franchise in your hands, right, to make basketball decisions um, has been unbelievable. And so I thank you, and I thank you guys, because this is like if you, if you could draw up your dream job, right, what would it be? This would be it. Oh, magic started off with a big hug and a big kiss. What's I up? What's can, up? I hope exactly. you can feel it through the screen. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's up? What's up, Isaiah? <laughs> I am good, man. I, I am really so happy for you. And I can't tell you, you know, just how many times that I've thought about, you know, how much you really love the Lakers. And I remember, 
you know, seeing you cry on the floor, you know, after losing in Boston and, you know, winning in the finals and everything else. And just, yeah. you know, it, it, it's hard to really describe to people how much you care and love the Los Angeles Lakers. And I'm truly happy for you. In September of 2002, Johnson was inducted into the Basketball Hall of Fame after a unanimous vote. Sharing the day was the player against whom he was measured from college days forward. Together, they invested the ceremony with a special light. I was going to write up a big speech, but I wanted to talk from my heart. But I said, damn, he broke my heart so many times, do I have anything left? <laughs> but I've always said that if you put Michael Jordan's name in a hat, Magic Johnson's name in a hat, and you picked out one of them, you wouldn't be disappointed at all. I have to thank God because 11 years ago, I didn't know if I would be here to accept this award. Larry, the biggest reason that I'm here is because of you making me go to that gym every summer not only stand for four hours, but I figured I'd better stay for six because I knew you were there about five or six yourself. Larry, you know, you, you're just what a basketball player should be. You. <clears throat> the biggest reason that I'm here is because of you. It was tremendous playing against you and uh, I'm just happy and I thank God that I got to know you, not as just Larry Bird, the basketball player, but Larry Bird, the man. And I appreciate you coming out here doing this. <clears throat> Larry, again, we're gonna meet up again, ready to go. So now let's get it on. Now we can play checkers. The thing that characterized his game was a Greek word called enthusiasmos the gift of giving the best with enthusiasm. That's what he did every game. I thank him for spreading the court out and, and making you go, did you see that? I thank him for making team bigger than I. It's not like that now. He taught me how to run my VCR because you never wanted to miss a magic game, you know? May God bless you all. Of all the nicknames, Probably as good as in is Magic Johnson. Magic is exactly what he was. All we can hope for as we go through that new millennium is that there'll be a Magic Johnson there for us. Nothing but net.